cities in the past. Um, it's not just Tulsa. So, just it's like not just Rosewood. Like the, those that we've heard and, you know, different things happen. There's a lot of black townships, black cities that were established. Um, and a lot of us nowadays don't believe or don't think that we can establish these things because we don't have the examples before us. We don't think that it's been done before. Garvey said, if man has done it, man can do it. And so we will provide information that you will be able to come to Sianda and live in our city or, or you know, uh, socialize in our city and at the same time study other African-led cities, you know, both here in America and abroad um, to get, get, you know, get some context of what it means to, uh, to do that thing. Um, what brought me to, what brought me to uh, land stewardship, um, I, was, I was 12 when I received the book, uh, The Message to the Black Man from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And in that book, he explicitly said that the answer for the African, he didn't say African, but the answer for the black man and woman, the black family, um, is in emphatically separation. Accept your own and do for self. Like we have to understand that if we want to be and an, an, an excel as a people, we have to take all of the responsibility of who we are and how and who we want to be. Reparations, cool, but with or without reparations, we must be. Whatever gifts or no gifts, we have to make it happen the way we want it to happen. Um, so I've been set up, I'm, I usually talk a lot, and I'm gonna I'm be quiet, I don't know if my five minutes up or whatever, but, um, I'm going to, you know, stop right there. Yeah, we got some more questions coming. Thank you back here. Excited to have you in this work and be a partner, you know, from New Orleans with you and seeing you do your thing in Alabama. It's beautiful. I'm going to kick it to Chris up in D.C. Yeah. All right. Appreciate y'all being here. This is so beautiful to see. Um, I grew up going to festivals just like this. And the only way you can grow up going to festivals like this is for somebody to take on responsibility for the community and bring people together around it. So, Deron. Thank you so much. Everybody coming out today is beautiful to see. <clears throat> um, I grew up around uh, black land. Uh, I'm, I'm a country boy. I'm from Morristown, Tennessee. It's about 35 miles east of Knoxville. I grew up with my uh, Uncle Walt hobby farming about an acre across the street from my grandmother's house. Uh, she would can and preserve all the things that came out of the garden. Um, we had walnut trees. We had peach trees, pear trees, all in the backyard. So I grew up uh, a country boy. Lived in Nashville up, in 2000, up until 2000 when I came to D.C. to go to school. And I could see that D.C. had that long history, not just in the city, but where folks had traveled from through the Great Migration. A lot of folks up in D.C., their people are from North Carolina. Uh, and that was real familiar to me being right across the way uh, in Tennessee. But, um, yeah, Tennessee is a wild state, man. On one end of the state, um, the Ku Klux Klan was formed in Pulaski. On the other end of the state, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, right? So it's a state deeply uh, entrenched and invested in white supremacy. We see it today with what happened with the Tennessee Three and what continues today in the Tennessee State Legislature. Um, so we got to continue to pay attention to the ways that in which, even though we don't want to often engage, we have to pay attention to what happens in electoral politics because they impact our communities. Um, up in D.C., a little bit more backstory. Um, Another part of my family, I'm glad you here mentioned Rosewood, another part of my family are survivors from Rosewood um, that ended up in Jacksonville, Georgia and Valdosta, Georgia, uh, where I just came from a family reunion uh, last week. So all these um, tragedies are distant but so close. My Aunt Eloise is 96 years old. She was at my family reunion. Um, her father, my great-great-grandfather, George Wells, along with my great-great-grandmothers, Sarah and Annie. Between the three of them had 32 children. So you can imagine how large this uh, family is. My family is on that side. We were all landholders, sharecroppers, farmers, uh, and we still retain our land in Georgia, in Tennessee, and that's not changing. We're about 50, 60 years, 50 years straight of having a family reunion every two years. 
that does not change. Black institutions and families matter. Um, in the city, you know, we're, we're lucky to be able to grow uh, food on three acres worth of space in, in Ward 7 and Ward 8. The last bastion of black DC, uh, Chocolate City, we used to be about 70% black. When I got to DC in 2000, now we're about 45% black. So, you know, land, selling grandma's house, you know, we can understand why in some instances, but also at the same time, when we start losing that culture, we start losing that tradition, we see that that financial impact is not as bad as the social impact when we're dealing with the intercommunity violence and other things because people feel so um, dislocated from their, from their culture and from their home. But that comes from capitalism and white supremacy and the pressure on folks to just make it day to day. And so as much as we can, you know, we want to build out community-based economic development, um, spaces where people can come and reconvene, the youth can connect with the elders in the, in the farm spaces, and uh, set the stage for some bigger picture uh, work, not just at the policy level, but grassroots organizing and building power and connecting with folks like yourselves. Uh, really excited to be here today to learn more, connect with new people, and share the stage with these amazing folks. Thank you, Chris. Oh, uh, Dreaming Out Loud is the organization. Yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing the story of your family and the history that y'all are still exactly. preserving. And it's so beautiful. I'm going to kick it to you, Ife. Please share what you want to share. You, you're so brilliant. So <laughs> feel free. It's an honor. Greetings. Good afternoon, everyone. Ife Killerman. Let me back up a little bit. Okay. Uh, Ife Kilimanjaro, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, born and raised, well, born in Detroit. I grew up uh, several years in Detroit and I, I returned to it. Um, been in the city for most of my life, in cities. Disconnected for several generations from land, although there was something about um, my life and, and early experiences that had me out on land. My grandmother, um, on my father's side, when I was young, my sister and I would visit, and they lived adjacent to woods. So early on, I was able to develop relationships with trees and with mosses and with um, critters that lived in those areas. Um, she grew her own food, and so we were able to um, pull, uh, pick food from the, the garden and, and she cooked it and prepared it for my sister and I and so having those uh, experiences for several years in a row as a young child not only um, left it a powerful impression on me but it really was foundational in my relationship with nature and an orientation to um, how important it is that we feed ourselves and grow our own food and when I returned to Detroit as an, uh, an adult I, I was down in DC for a bit at Howard hey, you anybody Hello. here and then uh, we, <laughs> and then when I went back to how to, to Detroit was really blessed to um, to meet with and and work with Baba Malik Yakini, who started the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, also a member of the Alliance and founder of D-Town Farm. And so um, not only did I develop the practice of growing food, um, but there was unlocked these memories that I didn't know I had about that relationship with many generations ago. So even though I didn't grow up are on land and with that experience of farming uh, from in my lifetime my mom didn't her mom didn't but there was still something so familiar and natural um, and being in relationship with the land and with the plants and the trees that um, coming back onto that uh, uh, re-entering into those relationships was very powerful and since then I've continued growing in different ways I um, work with an organization right now called Soul Fire Farm, which is based in upstate New York. And uh, Soul Fire was founded by initially, it was a, a family farm where they responded to a call from community on the south side of Albany uh, where they, there was limited access to healthy, nutritious food, um, but mem they were deeply in, in deep relationship with members of the community and when they learned that the, well these folks were farmers they had skills 
the put the challenge before them. Let's why don't we do something so that we can grow food and and, and we can help grow and then the food can come back and be, and support out us and our families and that's what they did. So that's a bit of the history of Soul Fire and since then for the past um, 10 plus years have been growing food. The aim now has been, or at least since it formed as a nonprofit about five years ago, is to disrupt, uh, uproot racism in the food system and they do that by growing food, distributing it to areas that are impacted by apartheid in Albany and Troy, and in the process educating uh, black, indigenous, and other people of color who are interested in learning how to be farmers or be connected with other farmers, so through the educational programs. Um, I continue to grow, I continue to be in relationship with the, the land in my home here in Chesterfield, Virginia. We've been here for about three years now. And um, and it's important to, to grow our own food. I mean, there are things that are very basic to life. And that's eat food, it's, it's being able to meet our fundamental needs, including food, you know, transportation, housing, um, and be able to do that in community with people with like hearts and minds. And so, um, we are slowly checking off boxes. Also, as a person who uh, works to address the climate crisis, um, f growing our own food is an important solution in uh, helping to address the warming of the planet. We're sitting in the sun. There are more increasingly um, hotter days, and, um, and that puts all of us, humans, and our relatives of different formations um, at risk of, of in the future being able to survive and so to the extent that we can shift our practices now uh, to extend the possibilities of our lives and those of our future uh, future generations um, those are things that I want to do and growing our food is part of it so I don't know if that sets up for the next it question does. thank you so much Ife. and before we go to the next question it's talk more you know, it, it's getting hotter. I know this is not the same sun that I grew up with, but I don't know about y'all, I'm from New Orleans and we keep getting record over 100 days and the, the index is, I'm trying to mitigate this, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, speaking of one of our co-founders of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance and growing our own food, you mentioned Baba Malik Yakini, a personal mentor of mine, and knowing that they started the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and opening a over $20 million community-owned grocery store in 2024 is so amazing. And just naming the things that we can do together if we just organize and, and stay committed. So shout out to Baba Malik for being that example and knowing that we can do this together. Um, so just wanted to highlight, um, you know, someone who's not here because with the Alliance, we are about self-determining food economies and we do that through co-ops. Um, and we're all about this democratic leadership. So excited to hear that. And I just wanna hear from you all if you wanna share some more, you know, about how we are facing climate change and, you know, what, what's going on in your impact? Like, what are you doing in your work to make sure that we're collectively modeling this resilience? Thank you. Um, so that's that's a big one. Um, like one one thing I, I'm certain that the Earth has not done anything to uh, transgress against its creation. Like nature, the nature of the Earth is still naturally what it is and what it has been. Um, so there's there's some things that are happening you know, uh, um, with the earth that, you know, it, it's going its course. And then there's other things that are happening as a result of the greed and our, our hardcore intention for capital um, and currency, which that's, that's One second. Time. Sorry, I just have a quick announcement. ULF 5290 Tesla is about to get towed. If your license plate is ULF 5290 and you have a Tesla, please move your car because it's about to be towed. Sorry. All right. So, um, anyway, long, 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 
the, the short of it all. Um, in Siandaland, we have the intention of uh, establishing practices that, you know, stick to like natural um, practices of not natural farming pra practices, uh, natural building practices, um, moving away from some of the things that uh, we are motivated to do based on, you know, dollar bills. Um, like, you know, we look at the, the food trucks out here, the food that we're eating. Uh, it's a lot of, um, unfortunately, you know, corporations, there's a lot of food that, um, can't even really call it food, there's a lot of things that we are partaking of and eating and ingesting that is not really food. And, you know, they grow it and put, you know, whatever chemicals in there to convince you that it's enough, you know, um, to do your body good. Um, and a lot of us, we participate in it. We buy stocks in it. We invest in it, you know, um, but not really thinking about the, the, the millions of children of our people that are coming behind us. Um, so I guess my, my only point in rambling right now about uh, uh, global warming and the whole nine is that each of us collectively, we have to figure things that, you know, we can do that are back to nature. I, I get it, the coding and the technology and everything is you know, it's lovely for what it is. Um, but there's a lot of things that we, that we don't want to do because it's hard work or heavy work or plenty work. Um, and we say that it's primitive or it's ancient and you know, um, there's a fine balance, right? There's a, there's a fine balance between technology and you know, just the natural things that, you know, we do. So we have to get a, you know, a hold on that. Um, I'm gonna stop right there. Appreciate you, Rakia. No, it's real, the technology can sometimes, you know, hinder us in moving to the direction we need to. Let me kick it to Gris. What y'all doing for regenerative practices? Yeah, for us, you know, regenerative uh, practices start um, on farm and the culture that we work to build around the work that we do. Um, you know, regenerative practices come from indigenous, come from Afro-indigenous practices, come from our cultural heritage. Um, but that also needs defense. Right now, speaking of the corporations, they're starting to co-op the term regenerative agriculture, right? So you're hearing Danone and McDonald's talk about we're practicing regenerative agriculture so that they can influence Congress to get more money to continue raping and pillaging the environment <laughs> so they can continue to do it for generations to come, what they what the madness of it is, they're gonna crash the whole planet and there won't be generations to come at this stage, at this rate, right? We know that, you know, we're heading quickly towards those tipping points where there's no uh, coming back from it, right? And so we're at a critical inflection point to be able to resist and get rid of these folks and, and do the things that are needed to make sustainable regenerative agriculture a reality. You know, we talk about even the United Nations acknowledges that regenerative agriculture is one of the ways to mitigate climate change, but we don't see the investment at the level needed because there's a capital motive around those other uh, incentives with corporations uh, and the power in which they, you know, they utilize that money to influence our uh, environment, right, our, our political environment. So for us, it's both the educational part, but also what we do day to day in the practices of, as as we're growing. Um, yeah, uh, I would also say, you know, regenerative agriculture is a, uh, it's also a spiritual practice. You know, you have to be in tune with the earth, in tune with what you're seeing and what you're feeling, um, which is something we, we deeply need is to be more in tune with what uh, each other are feeling and dealing with on a day to day. And these, these uh, touch points that we can build in community with community uh, are gonna be important as we kind of work to maintain our uh, mental and spiritual health with all this going on. Thank you, Chris, that was perfect. Go ahead, Ife. I really appreciate how what's being offered is, it's kind of moves from the macro to the specific, kind of moves from the macro to the specific, what, what um, 
is being offered. So there's a, a systems analysis that's necessary um, when we're talking about the climate crisis, what got us into this situation, and uh, which are these broader uh, systems of where white supremacy, economic, uh, colonial capitalism uh, is kind of creating the conditions for then industrial capitalism to, to have created this situation where the, the planet is warming to the degree that it is to the point where over between 150 and 200 species are going extinct each and every day. Um, and then kind of bringing it down to the importance, the role that regenerative agriculture can play in, among one of many solutions to the climate crisis. And examples of that that um, Soul Fire Farm is using and that we are using with our homes, the homestead specifically is around no-till, uh, so we don't till the land, we don't pull up um, uh, or dig into the soil uh, because doing so then releases carbon that's naturally held within the soil, but instead we build on top of the soil, garden beds, we use mulch to hold in nutrients, um, cover cropping to keep the soil covered, the, the root systems of cover crops of plants and trees uh, hold together the soil. So to the extent that we can keep maintain the, the integrity and the structure of the soil, it means that it mitigates erosion. Erosion releases carbon, it, um, it creates further erosion, and so uh, to the extent that our practices can mitigate that and prevent mm -hmm. it, that's what we're doing. We also intercrop, so planting, uh, not as opposed to monocropping where there are like acres and acres of uh, corn or um, peanuts or, or something, and, and in order to maintain such an unnatural presence of, of plants in the world, I mean, no plant grows naturally that way. We plant multiple crops that kind of complement one another. They cover the ground, so some cover the ground and pr put nutrients into the soil that taller crops are able to uh, draw and use as nourishment as they grow taller. So intercropping is an important um, uh, pr regenerative agricultural practice that we use. We also um, use uh, composting. So where we can um, you, to create our own compost from old food scraps that are able to naturally degrade and in time, you know, there's a process to it, but we're able to put that hummus, that rich uh, vitamin nutrients on top of the soil and then that feeds the soil. So instead of dump, putting it into the, the dumps, the city dumps, by taking that food waste and composting it, we're able to create our own fertilizer. We have chickens on our um, in, in our place uh, here in Chesterfield, so we use the uh, uh, chicken uh, manure and that, and incorporate that into the composting as well. Um, silvopasture, so just as an example of that, it's using the grazing of, of animals as part of the the garden or farm operation, where they're they can move in different places and eat, and then their poop fertilizes the areas that can then be planted in in the next season. So it, these are just some of the examples of regenerative agriculture that, are, that we're implementing and, and have implemented to, um, to build up the soil, to keep it nourished and healthy, and to maintain the, or, or to keep and bury, uh, uh, sequester carbon in the soil. Um, there's also a portion of land, so to, if, if you have access to land or on land, if there's a portion that can be dedicated to the, um, just growing trees, and, and perhaps even uh, you can agroforestry um, and do some harvesting among uh, within tree communities, like being preserving and protecting trees is another very important aspect of, of agroforestry and of um, helping to address or mitigate the climate crisis because again when we pull trees up trees are important um, number one they help keep carbon in the soil they also help prevent soil erosion and um, and they keep and those are very important aspects of uh, uh, that if if we don't do those things then it helps to accelerate 
um, climate crisis. These are things that we can do as individuals and as, I guess, operators of farm operation. Um, to the extent that we all can do them, we're developing practices and, uh, that are helpful and relationship with the land that in, that's important. And to get back to the whole systems question, you know, our, us as individuals are not the main contributors to the climate crisis. And so there's still an element of, of addressing and um, opposing the systems of destruction and oppression that are a necessary aspect of, of doing this work. And so just want to name that. So we can do what we can do, um, and it's important to do that. It's important in the process to shift and transform our relationship with the earth and with the, the environments that we're in. And we have to continue to um, to grow our own food, eat, eat our own food, grow our own foods, not buy the stuff that supports the destructive arms of, of colonial capitalism, and also actively oppose the ongoing and expansion of destruction. That's some bombs you just dropped right there. You say, wow. That was lots of ways that we can practice and ways that we are practicing regenerative agriculture. And I really want to um, harp on the point where you said it's not us individually that's co contributing to this. So there's a like victim narrative of individuals like, we don't recycle, so that's why the plant. No, no. There's oil and gas companies and large corporations that are exasperating this climate crisis. And something that we're doing at the Alliance with the Farm Bill legislation that's coming up is literally requesting and demanding that we divest from those harmful practices that are exasperating the climate crisis like the monocropping of the soybeans and the corn and investing in regenerative practices ones that our grandfathers and our you know people that came before us know that works like you said using the animal pet silver pasture and ensuring that we're incorporating all these things and being compensated for them as, as people are being compensated for destroying us so um, I, I just have one last question for you all, and I really um, just want to see if there's some ways that folks here today can get involved with the Black Land Movement, or how you can, you know, contribute to climate resilience in their own backyard or community. Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly, uh, all of us uh, not only should get involved; we like it's imperative that we all do. So, for instance. In, in the case of what we are doing um, to establish a city, um, you know, when, when people start th talking about going into intentional communities, they're always talking about, you know, um, I gotta be around somebody with, with people who think like me. Like we have to be, you know, we have to think alike, be like-minded. And truth of the matter is, most of us live in places where we don't even know the people who we live around. Um, so it's not that you can't live with people who don't think like you. The, the, the greater thought is that we have to consider what our agenda is collectively. Um, a lot of the things that are happening, you know, it's on, it might be on some cartoonish, you know, uh, G.I. Joe and uh, Legion of Doom and all these, you know, cartoons of superheroes and things, but believe me, at some point, you know, the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that 100% dissatisfaction brings about 100% change. Most of us are not dissatisfied with how we are living. And we are not dissatisfied enough with the buffoons who are uh, perpetuating the things that, you know, we, the things that we are, you know, being puppeted around uh, to support, like, it's just some things that we, we know don't make sense, but we're not willing to really stand up and just destroy, for instance, like destroy what we know is seeking to destroy us. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you, you have to find it in yourself. So what, what I'm saying is someone who's not necessarily interested in living around a whole bunch of black folk uh, 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 deciding on how to create a government for black folk. Um, not interested in, you know, some of the cultural dynamics of black folk. But love black folk enough to say, I, I support what you're doing. I think what you want to do for yourself is a good thing for you. Um, but I like making this money. 
Like, I will, I, as Sister Ife said, it's as simple as, you know, if you, if you live in, say, the project, wherever you are, do some container gardening. Like, grow your own food. Find something to do, find, create a, a network. In New Orleans, we have uh, the, what is the Backyard Gardeners um, Network, right? And this was, uh, this is a number of, you know, citizens in different neighborhoods who grow different foods and then they come together, exchange the foods that they want and like and need, and then everyone is fed. But we rather sit back and argue against uh, Wally World and his children and, and demand that you give me some, you know, some real food. Like, them people don't have to give you nothing. It's our responsibility, right? And, and when you really understand it's your responsibility, it, it's like, uh, I always say mama is the closest thing to God. Mama will pick up a car, kill concrete, drown a drop of water when you're messing with our babies. So we have to get mama fired. <laughs> we need to be mama fired in what we want for ourselves, as a, a, what we want for our people. And find your way, like team with somebody or some group, some organization, um, the same way you're thinking about how to get on that, uh, on that rocket ship with uh, Musket Felon, I mean, uh, Elon Musk, right? Like some of y'all, y'all, we gonna, I'm gonna get out of, I'm gonna get off of this planet, I'm going, on, I'm going to Mars. Because he's, you know, he doing the work. I ain't mad with him, like he won't go to Mars, go on him, blood, go on. But you have to determine what, what it is that we want because you can't do nothing in silos, nothing by yourself. We have to determine what we want to establish on this planet and this day. And then any, any um, horse with a man on it comes out the sky or any baby plane and UFOs that, you know, come down, like, if it's for us, if it's on our team, we already in motion. If it on, ain't on our team, then you better be ready to fight for it. Right? So, yeah, just find some group or some individuals. Create a group to do what it is you know, like that, what it is you see in, your, in yourself. Like, go into your own imagination. Fantasize. Because if you don't have your own fantasy, you might be living in somebody else's fantasy. And their fantasy might be your nightmare which has been what we have been living as a people. So, the album. Thank you, Bakiria. Find your tribe. I'll kick it to Chris. I would say, how you spend your time and how you spend your money. Spend your time with folks, building with folks. Uh, spend time on black farms, getting here. Sorry, is that better? So I said, how you spend your time and how you spend your money are two major components, right? Spend your time with folks in community, get your hands dirty, learn a new skill, right? There's a come a time of those networks that we rebuilt during the pandemic around mutual aid that were no strangers to us, um, as that's what we relied on, on generation after generation. We rebuilt some of those things during the pandemic. Don't let those things go. Right, we're gonna re re need those networks, those connections in neighborhoods, in communities to feed ourselves and protect ourselves again. Um, the way you spend your money, yeah, don't spend your money with people that are gonna use it against you. Right, buy food from black farmers. Uh, somewhere in your community, in your neighborhood, or somewhere in your region, there's a co op movement, there's a farm movement, somewhere you can plug into and spend those. Spend that time, donate, uh, invest, and uh, and build with your folks. Um, I would also say, you know, there's individuals that are doing the work. Tap in, whether it's um, picking up some literature and reading yourself. Um, political education is always going to be an important part of 
building movements and building the knowledge base and the frame for what we're seeing, right? It helps you interpret what you're seeing. Uh, knowing history means you can kind of predict what cycles are happening so we can be ahead of things uh, and not being, uh, you know, being proactive and not letting things happen to us. Um, so those are some of the strategies and ideas and things I would say are important for tapping in where you are uh, and plugging in with people that are already doing the work and being a joiner, right? They said it all. I, I don't have anything to add, and I, I'm not going to re repeat, um, but, but I really appreciate what was said. What I will say is that um, stick with it. You know, sometimes if, uh, it, you know, if the cucumbers don't come in right, we're like done. I'm not growing cucumber. I'm not doing this anymore. You know, we lose patience. And I would say stick with it. You know, the first year might be a loss. The second year might get a little bit of more, you know. And there are ebbs and flows. There are ebbs and flows, but stick with it. Connect with folks. Oh, you know, I don't want to get into repeating, but just really appreciate all that's been shared. The only other thing I add that I don't think has been said, and then it might be, a, you know, handing it off to you, Dr. Jazz, is um, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance is a really wonderful resource. And I heard they're going to be opening up membership again soon. So that might be a great opportunity to connect with black farmers around the country that um, and and to and see who is in your area that's also a member so i'll just leave it at that and turn it on back over thank you so much ife yeah absolutely finding your tribe we will be opening membership 2024 but we have lots of spaces if you're not a member that you can still participate in like our co-op peer-led group so if you're thinking about starting a grocery-led food co-op connect with me you can find us we have monthly calls and we peer learn together we just did a whole season on a on civic engagement i mean when we're building co-ops we're not just building stores but we're building community right now we're talking more about how we're going to get together in the supply chain like how we're going to build our black supply chain so all these topics that we're learning about together it's just really important that we, we do that. So excited to see if there's any questions from the audience before I pass it back to the panelists to let you know how they can find you. Any questions out there? Y'all have any anything to ask or want to know more about? We got Kalanji with a question. Can you bring this up? First off, thank you all. Just. Oh, they got First off, thank you all for your great work. And I think we all should give you a round of applause because y'all been doing excellent work. I'd also like to thank um, my leader, teacher, and guide, by Keir. <laughs> Teach me everything I know. But anyway, I, I wanted to ask, um, for folks who are interested in membership, how, do, uh, how would one uh, apply or join? And what's the website? I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but um, you know, it's my question. Any other questions? Any other questions? I got you, Kalani. Any other questions? I, I do have a question. Hi, I'm Ellis. Uh, but thank you all for being here. It's like really powerful to just hear your stories and the unity that through which you all speak only in language and terms. Uh, a lot of you spoke about culture, and I, I'm interested in how you connect that the idea of protecting our culture and creating resistance through our culture to the work that you do, and how it is incorporated into some of the regenerative practices that you mentioned. Because I hear about like making sure we're in a space for the generation to come, but also how are we making sure we're respecting the Afro-Indigenous practices that we are using and respecting the generation backward. You want to answer anything, Ethan? So I can share about the alliance at the end. Um, so, so the, uh, la, la. <laughs> um, so you know we understand that culture 
is the immune system of the people. Um, what every, I think uh, everything that that's been said or mentioned is about like it is about culture. It's about cultivating ourselves to be doing the things, uh, uh, um, exercising the kind of practices that are consistent and ongoing. Um, and and Sianda, here his his when you start talking about putting a, a, a town together, a city together, just a community together, um, it's, it's scary. We, we don't trust ourselves, oh, not, let me not say we don't trust, we are told and we tell ourselves we don't trust ourselves. So responsibility and trust are, are like key, key components of like forward movement. Um, when, when when we think about what it what it takes to uh, put people in line, or uh, uh, as as uh, Thomas Sankara and 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 Burkina Faso, to to get to create a land of upright people, we don't want to take on those tasks, those struggles, because I don't think that she could be a good woman. I don't think he could be a good man. I'm I'm the greatest man, you know what I'm saying, and on this, <laughs> right? So it was said a couple times, like patience and diligence. Like we have to we have to be diligent about the work that we have committed to do. Understanding that some of the people who reap the benefits of what we do are not really going to be worthy. Like they they going they going to be some shiftless. Africans, some undeserving Africans, but we don't stop or not do the work because they exist. We do the work because we're reproducing ourselves. We do the work because we know that there are many who are beyond deserving and beyond worthy. And so when you find yourself in a place to establish a uh, a community, a city of your own, then you have the capacity of uh, dictating and determining and controlling the everyday, you know, goings on of your community. So, for instance, I come out of my door and I see somebody who live in my city. First thing I do is speak and show love gratitude for the fact that you are living and breathing like me you can't you can't and you can't force you can't force attitude and right now in america we we have that we um we try to legislate and force attitude attitudes i love you because you're an african man i love you because you're african i love you know what i'm saying like it's just the nature of it. And so when, you, when you're dealing with um, what and like the, the, the different things that you do every day, just because, you know what I'm saying, everybody in the community um, understands the agenda and the mission of that community, that helps develop the cultural dynamic or the, the, the cultural standards that keeps us living and taking care of one another. If our culture was one that um, wasn't trying to make $10,000 in a month while playing uh, Grand Theft Auto, then we wouldn't have, you know what I'm saying, the, the type of things that happen. Like, anyway, I could talk a long time, but yes, the, the um, culturally, it's doing the work, diligently doing the work with the people who you love and being patient, being patient with everyone's work, whether they are, whether they are, um, you know, doing it at the most high and excellent space, are they struggling, right? 
the patience of mama again. When a child ain't doing right, she's patient with her child. She's not just tolerant, right? Tolerance means, I'd be glad when his name, when his mom, you know what I'm saying? But patience is, nah, I'm gonna I'm a work with this one. He a headbanger, but I'm gonna work with him. So, at any rate, yeah, cult, uh, um, it's really putting yourself in a position to, to grow what you know, you know, we want and need. So. Anybody else got a Yeah, I'd love to um, add, I really appreciate Brother Bakir, what you offer, and, um, and would also like to contribute by saying that the term, we're using this word regenerative agriculture is new, but the practices are not. They're very old. We've been doing them for millennia. Our relationship with nature um, and with the natural world became disrupted as, as our lives and communities were disrupted hundreds, decades, hundreds, thousands of years ago as various waves of, of uh, destroyers came through and snatched and enslaved and you know re reconfigured. And so uh, the relationship with the environment and you know it's reflected in, in the spirituality of indigenous practices um, we give we give names to elemental spirits and beings um, we we bring them to life when we invite their presence in our lives and and um, and in our families and in our communities so I've seen a lot of folks wearing um, uh, elekes and uh, ohene, uh, depending on what traditions that you're coming from. So these symbolize uh, our understanding and recognition of the life in nature around us and the power that it holds. And in the practices that we held, we recognized and appreciated the earth as a living being and interacted with and our farming practices reflected that recognition that this is a relative, a family member that, that we, um, that is helping us to live and that we in turn can, can help to live and, and thrive if we're in a healthy, reciprocal, regenerative relationship. And so all of this became disruptive. So when you're talking about resistance, was, which is one aspect of, uh, you know, when you're fighting against something that is or, or, or holding serve or try not to fall back when something is pressing on you and then there's the other aspect of it which I feel like Brother Bakir is speaking to when we're actively pushing to against it and breaking you know what are the things that are needed to do that it's remembering how we were in relationship uh, first and then drawing the power and strength from from that in addition to the resistance. So resistance helps us to survive, but we gotta do more than survive, which is where this other work comes in. And so, um, but it's all within us. We, we, we have it in our history, in our memories, in our DNA. And so then how do we access that? And that's through the connection with the, the planet itself, it's connection with the people who are also moving in the same direction, same, same heart, and uh, intentions and linking up and doing that work together. So that's the thing that I wanted to add. Ashley, thank you so much, Ife. And just speaking about culture from the Alliance, we have Leanne here, our comms and culture director. Thank you for all the work that you're doing to amplify the culture, to celebrate the culture, and also to preserve your uh, amazing storyteller. And that's one of the ways that we're continuing to be sure that we are preserving our culture to document these stories and the times that we're in, and also our past, because we got everything that we need. So I'm gonna just pass it to the panelists for one last quick minute to give a plug on where you can find them, how you can pull up on them, you know, find them on the socials and all that. Oh, one more question. I'm sorry, sorry. Co-op Oh, for Detroit. I got you. I got you. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll plug the alliance at the end, and we also have um, our annual um, report. Thanks again, Leanne, for making sure we got that out. And we have printed copies for anyone who'd like to see it and learn more about the alliance. But I'll tell you about how you can join membership there's just a now. Um, yeah, but I want them to plug themselves, and I'll, I'll wrap it up with how you can find us at the alliance as well. Uh, so again, my name is Bakir Tayyahembe, um, a co-founder of Sianda Land, a, a, a co-founder of Sianda Land in Alabama. 
Uh, West Alabama. Alabama. <laughs> Bama Tom. Um, you can find us. We have a uh, website, Siandalands. Dot com that's uh, S I Y A N D A L A N D S um, dot com. Siyanda is a is a Zulu term that means we are growing, and um, so you can find us there. There's also um, email you can get us at uh, Siyanda Land with the number seven. Um, at gmail.com and um, I, I toss my number out all the time I get a lot of foolish uh, spam callers so I don't I don't mind if you want to play on my phone I play with you too um, my, my, my phone number is 504 it's a new all this day 504 710 um, you can call or text me almost any given time. Um, I'm, I'm real easy, real approachable. And uh, there's other members of the Sianda Collective family who, um, you know, I can pa push you off to um, if I talk too much when I'm talking to you. But uh, feel free to reach out at, you know, any of those. In, in, in time, you know, we're, we're um, establishing a a glamping resort on a land um, to help bring folk. Just like uh, brother brother Duran constructed the, uh, the the wall tents and the, and the uh, yeah and the platforms with the yeah the wellness tents. Um, we have a few of those. We have a few. Um, uh, wooden structures so that you can come in, feel what it means to be on some land, uh, quote unquote off grid, like we run our own power. Um, and, you know, just get, get, uh, get familiar with it. And, um, yeah, just reach out. Uh, yeah, you can check dreamingoutloud.org uh, for the website at DOL DC uh, across all social media platforms. But if you're in DC, uh, pull up on us at the farm at Kelly Miller or the farm at Fort Stanton. Uh, we're also working on a, a 4,700 square foot food production uh, space that we'll be able to share with some other food producers and farmers uh, in Anacostia in Ward 8. So we'll be busy getting that off the ground 2024. Uh, that'll open up sometime. So yeah, putting some pieces into place, working with a lot of great folks, other farmers and food makers. Um, DOL DC across all social media, dreamingoutloud.org. Check us out. Ife <laughs> <laughs> um, Kilimanjaro, you can look into Soul Fire Farm at um, soulfirefarm.org. That's S O U L. F-I-R-E-F-A-R-M dot O-R-G. And then you can also say hello to me. I'm in the, I have a tent all the way in the back on this side, the right hand side, uh, where I'm selling some books and with some sisters who are uh, local Akumfo or priestesses here in Richmond. And um, yeah, come say hello and, and I can give you contact information. Thank y'all. And if y'all looking to check out the Alliance, we're at Black foodjustice.org, Black Food Justice Online, on the Instagrams. I'm like looking at Leanne, right? Right? Yeah. Um, but we also, like I mentioned, Justin has some annual meeting, um, annual impact reports that has talked about the work that we've done this year with all of our amazing members. Um, so check that out. Um, if you're looking for to join membership, please get on the waiting list. You just go to our website at blackfoodjustice.org and there's a membership link and you can fill out that form and we're going to holler at you soon. I really appreciate everybody who's come out. You know, I'm, I'm Jasmine, J-A-S-M-I-N-E at blackfoodjustice.org. If y'all want to reach out via email, I'll be around a little bit, but this has been a really amazing. I want to shout out again to Deron Chavis, Happily Natural Day. This has been beautiful, bringing so much community together for 20 years. Yes, you got to give it up. Um, please just continue to pour into each other and to the community. And if you're looking for one of the members that we keep mentioning, Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. It's a lot of letters, but all you got to Google is Malik 
Yakini, okay? Y A K I N I. Um, Baba Malik has been holding down the work of OG in this and has an amazing example of a seven acre farm in the middle of Detroit. They're opening the grocery store, like I said, over $20 million. Like, it's a long term investment that is owned by the community for black people. And I know I keep saying black, 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 we all blackity black. But when black people win, we all win, period. So that's, that's what we're about here. And I'm so thankful for y'all and listening to us. Let's give another round of applause, y'all. Give another round of applause. Round of applause, round of applause.